Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives, our jobs, our incomes, our debts, those of our children, those we're worried about and have to stay up nights worrying about. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and I continue to teach now as well as do programs like this. So let's jump into economic update for today. I want to talk about a set of problems. They have to do with major failures of large capitalist enterprises. And as I go through them, I want you to bear with me. The point here is not the particulars of each case. The point is to understand that these are all examples, symptoms, if you like, of an underlying system that makes enterprises work like this. The problem isn't this or that official or this or that company. It's a problem of a system whose rewards and punishments lead people to behave in particular ways. So let's start. Well, I was blown away by the first one. Here is the CEO of General Motors, wonderful example of leading American corporations, Mary Barra. She's in Beijing, China, and she's lecturing Chinese leaders. Here's what she's lecturing about. The Chinese government, like other governments around the world, is moving in the direction of outlawing all diesel motors and diesel engines in vehicles for all kinds of reasons, including the emissions scandal. That's when major companies, auto companies around the world, many of them, but the most important was VW, uh, were shown to have intentionally fiddled with the control mechanisms so that what you measure in a lab in the way of emissions is much lower than the actual emissions on the road when the vehicles are used. And she didn't like that. She didn't like government stepping in. And she gave them a lecture that, you know, she said, putting on her most serious face, it shouldn't be governments that make those decisions about technology. It should be consumers. Oh, what a wonderful idea. How nice. This is from a company that lied for years to consumers about the ignition scandals that cost a good number of them their lives and an even larger number of them serious injury. She wants us to trust large businesses to tell consumers what they need to know. Wow, that takes a, a lot of nerve. I admire her for that. But now let's go on because the examples come thick and fast. Last week, the Ford Motor Company announced that its very famous Explorer models from years 2011 to 2017, right to the moment, are facing recalls. Why? Because of fumes in the cabins that have bothered a number of people. A state trooper driving one of those was killed. There have been listen to this, 2,700 complaints about fumes in the cabins of Explorer, Ford Explorers. There have been more than a million that have now been identified as at risk for this problem, and that's how many will be recalled. Uh, it is extraordinary. By the way, it was years of these 2,700 complaints accumulating before we hear this last week that a recall may happen. Yeah, we should trust big corporations. Let's move on. Big item over the last few weeks was a wonderful action by one of the three great credit agencies in the world, Equifax. What did they do? Well, this is really wonderful. They had a vulnerability on their website that made it easy to hack in. Now watch the dates. They found out about it this last spring. There was a patch developed that could fix the problem on March 6th. All of this has been reported in the press. The hack happened in mid-May and it was reported a month or so later. During all of that lost time, get ready now, 
over a hundred million Americans, and it turns out another hefty uh, number of British citizens, have had their entire credit histories, including their personal information, their social security numbers, made available to hackers who in turn sell them. Wow. And the nerve goes even further. One of the few things Equifax has done since being exposed for having not managed this situation well and having not told people for months about its own failure, remember the advice of Mary Barra that we shouldn't have government interfere, we should just trust the corporations to tell the consumers what they need to know, Equifax offered compensation if the recipients were to waive their rights to go into court to sue Equifax for damages, if they accepted what was called, what is called compulsory arbitration, which always works to the company's favor. But now, in a way, the biggest example of all. On September 18th, the front page of the New York Times on that Monday carried a remarkable story. Here it is, in brief. Insurance companies, medical insurance companies, have been urging and pushing on to the people that they insure, who suffer from serious pain, a variety of addictive opioid medications, addictive painkillers, even when less addictive drugs were available to treat the pain. Why? Because the more addictive were cheaper for the insurance company to cover than the less addictive ones. And you know, when a company has a choice between what's profitable for it and what might be less addictive for this population, it's clear which way they choose. Once again, it's the government coming in and looking at the situation, because if we leave it to the companies, we know what they will do. So Mrs. Barra of General Motors, advice that we don't have the government, that we have consumers, you must be kidding, and I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt when I even say that. And what would be the alternative? You know, if public enterprises had performed as horribly as the four examples I just gave, there would be howls out there to get rid of public and let the private sector do that on the specious argument that the private would somehow avoid it. Where are the howls today that if the private automobile companies and the private medical insurance companies and so on and the private credit companies, when they don't work right, we ought to have the government step in? You don't hear those howls. Those are muted. The howling seems to push in one direction, not the other. Now, for me, just as a comment as an economist, the issue really isn't whether a private company does it or a government company does it. The issue is that all these decisions ought to be made by two participants, those who make the substance and those who consume it. There should be panels, institutions that allow the consumers and users of a product, together with the people who produce it, to do something that meets both of their needs. There is no warrant, no need, and much to be lost by allowing profit cal calculations to get involved in this situation, as my examples show. The next update has to do with Bernie Sanders. He's been in the news the last week or two because he's proposing that the Medicare program, which currently covers people 65 years of age and older with a kind of general government medical insurance program, be expanded to include everybody. It's basically Medicare for all. And he introduced a bill. That part I'm sure many of you know. But I want to go a little bit further and ask a question. Why is he having trouble getting people to line up with this? And I ask this question in the, re in the awareness, which I want to share with you, that the Pew Research Foundation, PEW, a very well-known, well-respected research organization, polling organization, 
has repeatedly shown that 60% of Americans support the federal government making sure all Americans have health coverage. 33% of Americans support the single payer program, which is close to what Bernie Sanders calls Medicare for all. So in view of uh, 60% who want the government to do this, and at least 33% who like exactly what Bernie Sanders is doing, how much support has he got in the U.S. Senate? Well, way more than he had before. The first time he introduced a bill like this, it was the support of one senator, namely him. This time, he has 16, 16 Democratic senators that have co-sponsored that bill. Now, that works out to 16% of the 100 senators who make up the U.S. Senate. So please note with me the numbers. 60% of Americans want this. 33% of Americans want exactly what Mr. Sanders has proposed. But he can only get 16% of the senators who supposedly represent the people to support him. And then comes the explanation. Somebody did the research. It was published by Common Dreams, so you can find it there. Uh, someone did the research to look at how much money medical insurers, they're the ones who stand to lose if the government becomes the real insurer, how much do medical insurance companies give to senators? And here's what we got. Senators who uh, do not sponsor, or at least have not yet sponsored, got an average of $55,000 from medical insurance industries. Those who sponsored got less than half of that on average. Schum uh, Mr. Sanders is the only senator who, from medical insurance companies, gets absolutely nothing. Wow. Out of the Democratic senators who have not agreed to sponsor, I thought you might be interested to find out uh, which of them got the most money. And you might be surprised. Out of all Democratic senators, the most, averaging $130,000 for their campaigns on average, were Senators Peter from Michigan, Wyden from Oregon, and Schumer from New York. Well, there's new studies about the opioid epidemic, the epidemic that last year took 64,000 lives in the United States. This epidemic of painkillers, both legally pre prescribed and illegal, is a far more deadly scourge in America than all the wars we're fighting, even these days when we fight so many much more deadly than car accidents. It's really extraordinary. A new research study uh, undertaken by Princeton economists shows a direct connection between painkiller addiction, on the one hand, and something called the labor force participation rate, on the other. The labor force participation rate, uh, participation rate excuse me, is a very important statistic. It measures what part of the adult, able-bodied population in America is either working or looking for work, participating in the labor force, and what part isn't. And the reason that number is very important is if your labor force participation rate goes down, if the percentage of your adult people that are working or looking for work shrinks, think of it this way. It means a smaller number of people are working to support a larger number of people who aren't. And that puts a strain on every family. It means somebody in the family who used to participate and therefore kick in money to sustain the family is now not participating and therefore not kicking in money to sustain the family. It puts an enormous burden on the population. We have a reduced labor force participation rate in this country, particularly since the crash of 2008. It has not recovered. Recovery has not th happened there. And that's why so many families feel pinched, because they have millions in this country, millions of people fewer in the labor force 
than were there before. And now we have part of the explanation. Addiction to painkillers makes it very hard to look for a job, makes it very hard to keep a job, and makes it unfortunately very easy to live outside the world of work, coping or struggling or zoned out on whatever it is that you're addicted to. The problem of addiction is an economic problem as well as personal tragedy. The next item. Well, I couldn't help this one. But before I get to it, let me remind you that we maintain two websites that are available 24-7 at no charge whatsoever, that carry a lot of the information that is available on this program. Indeed, there's an archive of all of these programs that you can listen to at your leisure. The first website is democracyatwork.info, all one word, democracyatwork.info. And the second one is rdwolf, with two Fs, dot com. Please make use of either website uh, at your leisure, you can communicate with us through them. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's a way of our partnering with you and you making use of the work we do for that purpose. Also, if you wish to see a video version of this program, you can find that on patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and we urge you to take a look that way. This next website has to do with the price gouging that came out of the storms, Harvey in Texas and Irma in Florida. Price gouging is a simply a technical term for people, but usually businesses, who use the crisis of a storm, either the storm coming or the storm having already hit, to jack up the prices of whatever it is they sell. So I've noticed in the last two weeks a number of big business spokespersons and conservatives saying something like the following. Don't blame, in this case, oil companies for the oil price hikes. Blame market forces. Other companies and other businesses have been saying that too. In other words, don't blame the people who actually raise the price. Blame somebody else. I was reminded of how in the old days, kings and emperors and czars used to evade blame for the awful things they did by saying they were just doing what the gods dictated, or that it really was the gods who made it all happen, not them, or maybe other magical forces that were at work. Prices rise, friends and neighbors, if and only if businesses raise them. There is no other way for the price to rise. And businesses spend a great deal of time, energy, and money manipulating supply and demand for what they produce. That's what advertising is, manipulating the demand. That's what controlling production lets you do, manipulate the supply. So to say that supply and demand and the market determine things is a way of suggesting it's somebody other than you. They work hard to disguise that they're responsible for the price. Don't be fooled. I next want to talk, a brief economic update, about a troubling reality. Some of you are upset, I assume many of you, by the things you watch and see President Trump doing. But President Trump has his imitators. He has others who do pretty much the same. And one surfaced this last week that I think bears watching. His name is Boris Johnson. He's the foreign minister, the foreign secretary in Great Britain, the equivalent there of what Rex Tillerson is here as secretary of state. Mr. Johnson is trying to use the Brexit vote, the vote that the British went through to withdraw from the rest of Europe, not to be part of the European Union. He's using that in order to pro promote himself, basically. He is going to save Britain. He is going to make Britain great again, literally. And he is doing something very interesting. He's pandering to the business community, just like Trump. He's doing the deregulation that the business community wants, just like Trump. And then he's promising to save the National Health Service in England, kind of like Trump promised 
to save Social Security. It's an attempt to suggest I'm a little different from the usual population of leaders and politicians, but in the end, it's not so different. It's a beginning of a kind of coming together of business and government, which does raise the bad smell of fascism, which was the formal way in Germany and Italy uh, that led up to the Second World War of a virtual merger between big capitalist enterprise on the one hand and the government as the muscle and enforcer of what they wanted on the other. The final economic update I want to spend some time uh, talking to you about. Well, let me do another one and then there'll be a final one. I want to go back to the price gouging uh, in places like Houston and Florida. I also read not only that somehow it's market forces, we talked about that, but I also read that, you know, you should be grateful in a way. I heard some of my colleagues, professional economists, of whom I am, frankly, ashamed, saying, well, you see, if the price, say, of oil or water or something else is jacked up, people will be much more careful about using it. So you see, people will be careful. And isn't that a good thing when the things are scarce? So raising the price gets you a good outcome. Here's another thing they said. If you raise up the price, there's more incentive for people to come in with more water or oil or gas precisely because the price is high. So let it go. Let the gouging happen because, you know, it's the system of supply and demand and it all works out well in the end. I've heard this kind of thing from my economics teachers all my life. So this is not a casual or surprising thing to hear. This is hearing about jacking up the prices of food and water and fuel in the midst of a crisis that comes logically to the minds of people who've been taught mainstream economics in this country for 50 years. Let me drive home how awful this is. It's the equivalent of saying something like this. A person drives a car into a crowd and hurts people. And the answer then comes from the economists, well, you know, there's a good outcome. People going into crowds are going to be more alert now after having seen or experiencing that than they would have been before. Oh, God. Yes, every event has a few good and many bad or many good and a few bad. To say that there is something that happens that's good is never a justification. You have to begin to look at the balance of the goods and the bads. Let's go back to the storms. If you raise the price of water and food, you're basically saying that we are going to let people go hungry, go thirsty in the middle of a crisis because they don't have enough money. Not because we don't have enough stuff, but because they don't have enough money. You're deciding to ration what may be life-saving items based on ability to pay, not based on our shared humanity, not based on our equality before the law or the equality before a God if you believe in one, etc. Wow, that is moral depravity. And it doesn't get any better if an economic argument is a fake veneer over the underlying depravity. The instinct of people to help one another is a much more important maintainer of community and solidarity and a viable society than listening to economists and telling yourself stories about what one or two positive outcomes can be from an event you know to be horrible. If you drive a car into a crowd of people and they become more alert because they've been hurt, in the future they'll be more alert, that's not a justification for driving cars into crowds of people now, is it? Well, the last economic update comes out of a Census Bureau report on income inequality that came out this last week. It immediately provoked a flurry of statements from the Trump administration because it showed that in the last two years, there's been some improvement 
in inequality, some improvement in incomes for people at the bottom end of the society. And there has been. There's no question the last two years, it's gone a little bit up. But men and women listening to me, it's gone up for two years in a system that has been going in the other direction for 40 years, since the 1970s. And everybody who pays any attention knows that. To fasten on two years, and by the way, if you looked at the statistics, 2015 was a better improvement than 2016, so that the improvement is already shrinking. But put that aside, you had two years of improved numbers. But they don't begin to change the basic picture. And to drive that home, let's take a look at the very statistics that were re released. Here's what it shows. That from 1947, that's the end of World War II, to 1979, if you divide the American population into fifths, the poorest fifth, the middle fifth, the richest fifth, they all grew roughly in terms of their real income, how much they had to buy, how much they could afford to buy, they all grew between two and two and a half percent. The poorest, the richest, and those in the middle. So you had the ability to say from 1947 to 79, as capitalism grew, it treated its population, at least in the United States, roughly equally. Because of the limits of time, let me jump to the later period, 1979 to 2007. In all, except the richest, it drops to almost nothing. Let me do that again. In all, except the richest fifth, it drops to almost nothing, no increase. The richest fifth gained more in those latter years than, the other, than they had before. Their situation went up, everybody else's went down. And in the last period, 2007 to 2016, there is negative for the poorest and way better than everybody else for the richest 5% who really cashed in. That's the reality, folks, of 40 years, 50 years. It's not changed by two years. Shame on the New York Times and the others who pretended otherwise. We've come to the end of the first half of Economic Update. I hope you found these discussions interesting. Please stay with us. We will be right back. <laughs>